Ah, it's December 30th, 2019. Y'all remember, before everything just went completely to shit? Thank you! Thank you! The old year was almost gone and the new year was nigh. Everyone was sitting around making their last call preparations for their soirees and their new year's parties. And a lot of people were checking on their last year's resolutions, noticing how they didn't fall through with them again. Just like our friend Bob here. But don't you worry, Bob. Technically, you still have time. Although, I don't really see how stop being a crippling alcoholic can be achieved in a couple hours or so. But Bob's gonna still try. Because that's just him. That's how he rolls. On another corner of the world, though, far from our friend Bob and his debilitating life problems, a very peculiar scene is taking place. For our story, we have to travel all the way to the land of the rising sun. In Osaka Airport, Japan, a group of men passes by security carrying boxes of equipment. At first glance, this seems rather normal, but there's a catch. Because one of the boxes is not like the others, for it contains a person worth $120 million. I know what you're thinking and no, this is not a sex trafficking ring that just kidnapped Beyonce as a gift to the Japanese emperor for New Year's. Although that would have been a cool story. Not for Beyonce though, no. Inside the box is multimillionaire, former chairman of Nissan, and former legend of the automobile industry, Carlos Ghosn. Mr. Ghosn is on his way trying to flee Japan. In order to avoid a trial, it's probably going to put him behind bars for a very long time. To say that Mr. Ghosn is in a bit of a pickle is a little bit of an understatement. But how did a businessman like him, once revered in Japan as one of the titans of the global car industry, experience such a dramatic fall? And how did he eventually make his flight out of the country. This is the story of Carlos Ghosn and his dramatic escape from Japan. This year is going to be another record year for the industry. To me, it feels like we are at the dawn of a new spring. We sell 10.6 million cars. For over 130 days in detention, I am innocent of all the charges. All of them. Since I was brutally taken from my world, ripped from my family, my friends, my communities, I left Japan because I wanted justice. And if I can't, don't get it in Japan, I'm going to get it somewhere else. Okay, now, a little backstory. So Carlos was born in 1954 in Porto Velho, in the beautiful country of Brazil. His family was of Lebanese descent and was pretty well off. His grandpa was in the rubber trade, that's in actual rubbers, not condoms. And his father was a diamond trader. Now it made sense for the family bug of entrepreneurship to be in the ear of little Carlos since the beginning. When he was six, he moved back to Lebanon where growing up and being a Brazilian born Lebanese, Probably got him a lot of pussy, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, come on, that is a sexy combo, don't lie to yourself. From there, he went on to get educated and he did some boring work stuff. He worked for Michelin for a couple of years and fast forward to the 90s. The year is 1996 and Carlos is hot. Hot not just because he's a sexy Brazilian Lebanese man, but also because he's made a bit of a name for himself for being a very hard worker, I guess. So he's approached by Renault, the famous French car manufacturer that makes a bunch of boring French cars, which is all French cars besides the ones made by Bugatti. I'm kidding. Nah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Nah. Hey, we shut the fuck up now. Listen to the story. So Renault recruits him because they're running into some financial troubles and they've hired Carlos to do a little restructuring. And oh boy, restructuring he did. In fact, his restructuring was a whole true spectacle to behold. I mean, our man changes the assembly process, cuts down on cost, he increases production, what the fuck? He is given the name <clears throat> Le Cost Killer. And soon the time comes for Carlos to repeat his dazzling trick of reorganizing as Renault acquires Nissan, the Japanese car manufacturer. And here I want to pause for a second just to make something clear. Now, we all know Nissan nowadays as the car-making behemoth that it is. I mean, come on, it's the ninth largest car manufacturer in the world. And at some point, it was even the fourth largest in the world. It has given us wonders we're not worthy of as human beings. Like the Nissan GTR, the 911 killer. The most important question in motoring, which is faster, a Nissan GTR or a woman? The GTR, I mean, what else could you possibly ask for? 
also the Nissan Navera. But back in the 90s, the company was a travesty. It was bankrupt, nothing was working, they had like a billion trillion models like freaking Pokemon all being made in the same assembly line. And the company had a 20 million dollar consolidated debt. Which I don't know exactly what that is, but the number is pretty big. Most in the automotive industry considered this company a lost cause. But not Carlos. For Carlos, this sounded exactly like the type of job a sexy Brazilian born Lebanese son of a diamond trader could do. And that was him. And that's what Carlos did. He started his Nissan revival plan in 1999 and quickly made the company turn back into profit a mere one year later. In 2000, he became COO of the company, that is Chief Operating Officer. And one year later, he became CEO of the company, that's the king of the company. And also, side note, he was also the CEO of Renault at that time. So by 2001, he became the first person in history to run two Fortune 500 companies at the same time. Carlos by that point had achieved godlike status in the business world, and with godlike status came godlike salaries. From Nissan alone, Carlos was receiving $6.5 million annually, and by 2018, he was worth $120 million. This motherfucker, this mad lad, he had made it. And motherfucker really spent them monies. Yep, he did. He had a penthouse in Tokyo. He had a real estate property in Paris, France. In New York, Amsterdam. He even had his own personal vineyard in Lebanon. In 2016, he got married for the second time, mind you. And the Bankway slash ultra rich party slash eyes wide shut mosque orgy, I guess, was held, get this, in the fucking Versailles. That's the palace where the King of France used to live. Oh, by the way, the invitation card read, I trust in your total discretion in this event. Yeah, that was probably an orgy, man. <laughs> Anyways, the whole party was said to have cost around $700,000. And that was back in 2016. So adjusting for inflation, that is a lot of fucking money. <laughs> but also back in the land of the rising sun, Carlos was enjoying a pop culture icon status. He undoubtedly became one of the most well-recognized foreigners in Japan. He was a person who saved one of the country's largest and most historic car manufacturers from the brink of disaster. He was so famous that the Japanese made manga out of his life, which sounds like a very Japanese thing to do. And I'm not even kidding, this this happened. The manga was called The Real Life and Times of Carlos Ghosn. You know, just to let you know that this was some truthful shit. And it chronicled how this guy saved Nissan and it became a must read for every ambitious businessman in Japan. In this manga, Carlos supposedly had the ability to distinguish car models and their brands just by listening to them drive by. I really love how they emphasized the real in the title. You know, stuff from the real life and times of Carlos Ghosn. They also had bento boxes with his face on them, sushi rolls that looked like him. Bro, I'm telling you, if this guy hadn't been caught, Studio Ghibli would have made an animation about his life. Facts. So what else is there to say? Super famous, super successful, super rich, highly revered businessman with only one failed marriage. Sexy Brazilian born Lebanese. <laughs> I'm gonna get so much mileage out of this. People make fucking California rolls with your face on them. Nobody can deny it. Things were going pretty well for fucking Carlos. But, just like every good story ever, shit has to go bad at some point. So our guy has been making headlines for years. He's making money, he's getting married for a second time, which is what all rich people do. So Carlos was doing all the right things for, you know, his societal echelon. By 2015, he was spearheading Nissan's turn to electric vehicles. Everything was looking fine. Or, that's what you would think. In 2016, Nissan lawyers and Japanese authorities started looking into Gon, and they found, in an internal investigation conducted, that our man here had been under-reporting his income for four years to a sum that amounted to close to 4 billion yen, and that's approximately 35 million dollars, in quote, hidden funds. They also found that Carlos had paid for family vacation using Nissan funds and was found to have owned a home in Paris that was bought with Nissan money again. Carlos later denied all of these accusations, saying that he was framed. Apparently, while he was working in the company, Carlos had made a lot of enemies, basically hardcore Japanese nationalists who didn't want the company to be run by a foreigner. Now, this case is still pretty murky, so we're not going to stand on the allegations too much. But anyways, a case against our man Carlos had formed, and on November 19th, 2018, he was arrested in Tokyo airport while walking out of his private fucking jet. Now, that's a nice way to get 
get arrested. If you were ever going to get arrested, that is, which you shouldn't. In a later interview, Carlos claimed that it was a very frightening experience, like getting hit by a bus. If the bus is two neatly clad Japanese prosecutors and you walking into the bus is you walking out of your private fucking jet. Now in Japan, the penal system is pretty fucking hardcore and Carlos was essentially destroyed, having been turned overnight from a Japanese business legend to a low-life fucking criminal who was essentially stealing money from the Japanese public. He was looking at time in prison in Japan for an undisclosed amount of years. But the worst thing, the absolute worst thing about his predicament was people stopped making little sushi rolls with his face. That, that is fucking low, man. Good lord horrible stuff. Carlos was arrested and immediately put into solitary confinement for 120 days. Also known as a gamer's dream, right? Well, for our Chad Carlos, it was a fucking horrible nightmare. And there's really no way out of this. I mean, the Japanese legal system is notoriously very tough on defendants. But to be fair, they did give him a good 10 minutes to defend himself on that first trial, so I guess that's good. Carlos did a lot of back and forth uh, in court, and he was eventually allowed to stay in his house, but under strict police surveillance. He was under house arrest, with no access to the outside world, and no access to the internet. How the fuck are you going to live without porn? I mean, stocks. How the fuck are you going to look at your stocks if you don't have, you know, an internet access? You know, Fortune 500 shit. But the worst part was that for Carlos, a man in his 60s, he was looking at 10 to 15 years in jail. And that meant a huge chunk of his remaining life, essentially. He also had a very, very hard time seeing his family because visits were not really allowed all the time. So let's think about this for a second. <clears throat> You're 60 something years old uh, in a foreign country. You are looking to what essentially is the remainder of your life be spent in prison. You can't see your family who is also halfway across the world, but there's a catch. You are super fucking rich. So what do you do? Do you A, respect the law and abide by it, fully committing to accepting your punishment with reverence to the legal system, which is truly the one stark thing that separates us from the beasts? Or B, use your money and influence to orchestrate an elaborate escape? If you answered the latter, I'll have you know that Carlos did not share your felonious little fucking evil ways, you little shits. For Carlos accepted his fate, and like a modern day Socrates, he boldly looked at the judge and he said, judge. Whatever punishment you have in store for me, I shall take it. For I might be innocent, and I might lose the ability to see my family, and I might lose my freedom even, but I shall never lose my moral compass and my strong sense of morality. So give it, judge, sign those papers, and let me be incarcerated for as long as you like. I shall be here and I will... <laughs> Nah, man, I'm kidding. He immediately planned to escape. In the actual words of Carlos, the escape had to be bold. Something nobody would ever expect you to do. But to orchestrate his escape, Carlos had to put up the perfect crew. The masterminds behind Carlos Ghosn's escape were Americans Michael and Peter Taylor. Michael Taylor was a Green Beret veteran. Having served in the Lebanese Civil War, he was just the right man with the experience necessary to get Carlos out of his difficult situation. And Peter Taylor, his son, was his son. So the case is simple. Carlos is here, but where he currently wants to be is over here. Now to get from here to there, Carlos would have to take a plane. All right, that's pretty simple up until this point, but there's a catch. Carlos is a fucking criminal in Japan and super recognizable. He's also being tailed 24 seven by some interns in the police department. So the problem here is that he can't walk out of his house and walk into an airport and just fly away. In case, you know, you, you didn't understand. He also cannot take the plane from a very busy airport. So that rules out Tokyo airport, which was close to Carlos's home at the time. He would have to find a less crowded airport. Q? Osaka International. It serves only 14 million passengers a year, not like the cramping 88 million of Tokyo International. Also, security there is a lot more lax. If you've ever been to a regional airport anywhere in the world, you would know what I'm talking about. Carlos would just have to make his way over there and somehow get on a plane. And while doing all of this, Carlos will most certainly have to lose his tail. The tailors, though, had found two major weak points to exploit in this whole situation. One was that Carlos, albeit being a high-profile criminal, he was nonetheless allowed to travel anywhere within Japan. So he could theoretically travel to Osaka with no problem. The second was about the trail. Carlos's crew had noticed that the folks tailing him 
would not enter the buildings Carlos was getting into. They would just sit outside and wait for him to come out like a bunch of fucking noobs. And they would also leave whenever tabloids of journalists would wait outside Gon's house for any interviews. And that's really all they wanted to devise a plan. And that they did. Carlos just called one day a bunch of journalists to go to his house for an interview. That made the folks tailing him leave. The journalists came to his house, Gon never showed up so they left. And the tail didn't come back. And that's when Carlos just opened his door and walked out. So with no tail behind him, Carlos is just walking around trying to make his way to Osaka International. But Carlos can't just fucking walk around wearing fucking Bodega Veneta or whatever the fuck executives wear. He has to wear normal pleb clothes like us. So for that, Carlos would put the biggest fucking costume of his life. A pair of jeans and a tracksuit. <laughs> so Carlos did all of that, went to Tokyo train station, purchased a ticket for Osaka, took the train, and left. In Osaka, the father-son duo were waiting for Carlos for the most critical phase of this whole plan. Getting Carlos on that plane. And here's the problem. How in the fuck are you gonna put the most recognizable foreigner in Japan through airport security into a plane? Well, the solution is pretty fucking simple if you think about it. Like, duh, you put him in a big fucking box. But Gingerous, what about the x-rays I hear you say? You can't just stuff a person in a box and put him through airport security. It won't work, speaking from experience. But that's not really a problem either because Carlos's crew has thought of this as well. Human traffickers take notes. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Now, have you ever been to a concert, you know? Have you ever left your fucking house, you piece of shit? Well, if you've ever been to a concert, have you ever seen those big ass fucking boxes that bands have, that have the fucking instruments in there and the whole, I don't know, I don't know what bands use, but they have these big fucking boxes. Well, that's exactly where they would stuff in Carlos. The Taylors would pose as a band leaving Japan from their concert and they would be carrying their entire equipment with them. Inside those boxes carrying the equipment, that's where Carlos will be hiding. And from there they would put him on a fucking plane and just straight to fucking Lebanon from Japan. Pretty solid plan, right? It, I'm kidding, to me it sounds like fucking B-movie script. This was a fucking movie on Netflix. We would all be here making fun of it. But it's fucking real life, and I kid you not, it fucking worked. Carlos went exactly like this, through airport security, into a private fucking jet, and from there he went to Turkey, and from Turkey he went to fucking Lebanon. Insane. And this whole fucking plan happened. December 29th, 2019. Y'all remember where you were that day? Yeah, you were crying over your last year's resolutions that you fucked over once again. No hookers, no cocaine? Yeah, right. Well, somewhere on the other side of the world, Carlos was escaping from Japan. On a side note here, in an interview done later, Carlos talked about the exact moment that airport security was going through the boxes and, you know, like, examining them. The tailors told airport security that the particular box Carlos was in had a very sensitive musical instrument, and if they did any sort of x-ray on it, the instrument would fry, probably explode, obliterating everything on a 15-mile radius. And the Japanese, of all people, are very sensitive about big-ass explosions, so they just let him slide. Carlos Ghosn was safely transported from Japan to Turkey and from Turkey to Lebanon. And on the morning of December 30th, 2019, news outlets across the world were reporting the most unbelievable story. An escape of a fallen tycoon turned criminal out of one of the world's most advanced tech countries. And that is the end of our story. But wait, what on earth happened to all these souls who took part in this daring feat of getaway? Well, you'll all be very surprised. After his escape, Gon reunited with the one thing that had been missing from his life this entire time, his family. He decided that his corporate days were over, and what he really wanted to focus on was his lifelong passion of being a dog breeder. He now breeds award-winning golden retrievers in his Beirut home with his wife Carol. As for Michael and Peter Taylor, well, they own a beetroot farm in Oregon. They used all the money they made from this job to found a San Francisco-based startup that specializes on eco-friendly jet fuel. And let's just say, their little business venture literally took off. I'm fucking kidding, they're in fucking jail. They're locked up in a Tokyo prison. They were extradited to Japan, where they were both found guilty of helping Carlos evade justice, and thus they were sentenced to three years behind bars. Carlos is fine though. 
He lives in Beirut and he's currently working on seeking retribution for his allegations. After his landing in Lebanon, he announced in a press conference that he would do his utmost best to try and rectify all the accusations that were made against him by the Japanese authorities. The Japanese on their side issued an international warrant on his arrest, which to this day has not been passed by Interpol. Carlos also runs a non-profit organization and he occasionally enjoys beefing with Nissan. He's also like even more famous now. He has his own fucking documentary on the BBC, which I didn't know existed when I was making the script, and I'm kind of pissed off because it would have made my life a hell of a lot easier. He's also trying to raise awareness on the so-called hostage justice system in Japan. So, you know, I guess, yeah. good for you, brother. And I was watching a podcast with the man himself the other day, and what in the fuck is this, Cho? I mean, CEO of two Fortune 500 companies, international fugitive, and then president? <laughs> God damn, Carlos, just stop already. I don't think he's gonna do it, but you know, and if he does, it would be kind of fitting because you know, at this point he's done everything in fucking life. He's like literally the Snoop Dogg of the business world. As for the rest of Carlos's crew, well, we don't even know who they are. I'm guessing there were more people because like two motherfuckers alone can't pull shit like this. But I guess we'll never know. And that's our story, folks. From humble beginnings, to the top of the world, to criminal, to fugitive, and alas, free man in Lebanon. That's the story of Carlos Ghosn, the sexy Brazilian-Lebanese tycoon, and of his great escape. I hope you enjoyed.